வணக்கம் ஹலோ ஃப்ரெண்ட்ஸ் ஆஸ் வி ரிட்டர்ன் டு த ரூல் ஆஃப் தி ஏர்லி சோலாஸ் த கிங் ஹூ கேம் இன் த நைன்த் ஜெனரேஷன் ரூலிங் பிட்வீன் ஒன் ஹண்ட் அண்ட் ஃபிஃப்டி அண்ட் ஒன் ஹண்ட் அண்ட் செவன்டி ஃபைவ் காமன் ஈரா வாஸ் பெருனர் கிள்ளி த கிரேட் அண்ட் குட் கிள்ளி ஹூ வாஸ் த கிராண்ட் சன் ஆஃப் நலம் கிள்ளி அண்ட் த சன் ஆஃப் கிள்ளி வளவன் ஹிஸ் சிங்கிள் டிக்கெட் டு ஃபேம் சீம்ஸ் டு பி ஹிஸ் ஹேவிங் கண்டக்டட் த ராஜசுய யாகா the great royal sacrifice that earned him the epithet rajasuyam veta perinar killi this great royal sacrifice is mentioned in the epics like mahabharata and ramayana as a shrauta ritual of the vedic religion performed at the time of the consecration of a new king it involved imperial sacrifice and performing the yaga rendered a king into a chakravarti or an emperor while the shatapata brahmana states that this yaga was to be performed only by kshatriyas and was not suitable for the brahmanas the taitriya corpus mentions the following as part of the great sacrifice soma pressing soma being the intoxicant drink a chariot ride the king shooting bows from his arrow and a symbolic cattle raid a common practice in many ancient cultures where the newly anointed king seized the cattle of his relative and gave him in return a parcel of his land also included was a game of throwing dice with a specially appointed priest known as the advaryu priest now does all this ring a bell mahabharata shows the rajasuya yaga having been performed by Yudhishthira the eldest of the Panja Pandavas to establish his legitimacy as supreme ruler over all the other kings and even heavenly deities performing the yaga not only enthroned the king but was believed to regenerate the cosmos it was performed by other epic heroes like king rama of ayodhya in the ramayana and the king harish chandra as alien a ritual as it gets in tamil country of your what is the likelihood that a tamil king all those 2000 years ago could have actually performed a rajasuya yaga entitling him to get placed amidst these epic heroes there are three puranaanuru poems in praise of pernar killi sung by avvayar Pandaran Kannanar and Ulochanar nowhere in these poems is there a mention of this king having conducted the great royal sacrifice having succeeded to the prosperous kingdom that his father Killi Valavan had consolidated there is no account of any great war or military victory credited to this king like for example a talayalanganam for pandian nedunjeliyan and hence no military exploits to justify this king performing the rajasuya yaga in an attempt to declare himself an emperor we must remember the statement made by k n sivaraja pillai in his the chronology of the early tamils that any great praiseworthy deed performed by any of the triumvirate the movender should have first and foremost be recorded in the praise poetry rendered by the contemporaneous poets who lived during their time so given the three purananuru poems in praise of this king do not mention this event itself is cause for dubiousness says he it is very clear that the epithet rajasuyam veta should have been added to the name of pernar killi at a much later date by the redactors who are credited with attaching the colophons to every poem now we have seen how the colophons to every poem give a suitable title based on the content of the poem the name of the poet as well as the name of the personage in whose praise the poem was rendered sometimes with an epithet to the name of the personage definitely added a few centuries after the poems themselves were composed unfortunately none of the sangam poets left behind a signature of their own in the body of their works for example if we take the hymns of the 7th century saivite saint trinyana sammandar whose works form the first second and third compilations in the tirumurai at the end of every padiham in the last stanza sammandar records his name and it is on the strength of this that his poems were grouped into the three tirumurais with such an information not being available 
the redactors had to make up descriptive names based on the place where a poet was born, based on the profession that he was engaged in, and sometimes by simply picking out words from the very poem that they rendered. For example, the words Kake Padiniar attached to Nachalayar comes from a poem sung by the poetess on a crow, the Kake. For another example, if we take one of the most popular among the Sangam poets, Kaniyan Poongundranar, even there, Kaniyan refers to the occupation, meaning something to do with numbers or astronomy, and Poongundram being a place near Madurai where the poet should have lived. Many scholars have questioned the veracity of the names given to these poets. For example, in the last episode, we saw a poem rendered by a poet, Perail Muruvalar. The laughing man of the big fortress translates Nilaganda Sastri, with some scholars even claiming that Muruvalar could have been a lady poet, given that Muruval, meaning a gentle smile, is more associated with women. While there are quite a few such absurd names, historians have also questioned the epithets added to the personages sung by these poets, and there is no way of cross-verifying them. So what was the intention of affixing the epithet Rajasuyam Veta to the name of Perinar Killi? Was it a conscious attempt to bring these ancient Tamil kings who were real historic personages into the Vedic fold, albeit posthumously, in order to show that ancient Tamil society was indeed a Vedic society? Was it because the medieval Chola kings were desirous of according their ancestors a Kshatriya status? Kainas observes that the assumption that the Chola power should have risen to its zenith in order to justify the performance of the Rajasuya Yaga was all based on a poem rendered by Avayar in Purana Nuru. This Purana Nuru poem indeed has great chronological value, as in this poem, Avayar records her happiness in seeing all the three contemporary rulers, the triumvirate, in the court of Perinar Killi. The Pandya contemporary king, as we saw in the previous episode, being Ukkara Peruvaridi, and the Chera king being Cheramvan Mari Vanko. But the poem itself has nothing to indicate that such a big yaga was performed. We will see this poem in detail to understand that Avayar indeed does not record any such great sacrifice and on the other hand points out charity to the needy as the way to immortal fame. Purana Nuru poem 367 that is titled Vara Chaitha Nalvinai goes Nahatanna pahar mandilam tamave ayinum tammodu sella vetor ayinum notor kuvuliyum yetra par parku irngai niraya poovum ponnum punal pada sorindu pasilai magalir polangalathu yendiya narari theral maandi magil sirandu iravalarku arungalam arugadu veesi vaaldal vendum ivan varainda vaigal o great tree a king's fine land that resembles the heavens, he cannot take with him. It will pass on to mighty men, even though they may be strangers. To Brahmins who come in need with wet hands, you offer flowers and gold by pouring water. You enjoy drinking fiber-filtered toddy in golden vessels, served by women wearing fine jewels. Of charitable disposition, you give great wealth, to those who come in need of help. May you live splendidly through the days allotted for you in this world. Highlighting their indulgence in worldly pleasures, Avayar seems to want them to contemplate the afterlife. Vara chayda nalvinai alladu, aalum kalai punai piridillai, onru purind adangiya irubirappalar, mutti puraya kaantaha irindha, kotra venkodai kodidair vendir, when you die, the good deeds that you have performed will be the only raft, nothing else. O kings who ride chariots with flags and own victorious white umbrellas, the three of you together are beautiful to behold like the three sacrificial fires of the twice-born Brahmins who have subdued their senses through their will. 
This is what I understand of this world. So while the poem mentions arms being offered to Brahmins by the Movender, and indeed records one or two words that denote specific practices undertaken by Vedic Brahmins, like the Mutti that refers to the three sacrificial fires that go by the name Ahavaniyam, Takinakini, and Karuhapatyam. There are many explanations given by commentators like Nachinar Kinir as to the purpose and reason behind these three fires. The term twice born, Irubira Parlar, referring to a Brahmin who is believed to be reborn after he adorns the Poonul, the sacred thread. So while these verses attest to the presence of Vedic Brahmins in that ancient Tamil society, there is nothing in specific in this poem to indicate that Pernar Kirli performed the Rajasoya Yaga, let alone invite the other two Movenders to the sacrifice. The Puram poem by Pandurankananar that describes the ruinations visited upon by Pernar Kirli on his enemies does not talk about a great royal sacrifice either. Purana Nuru poem 16, titled Sevvanum Sudunerupum, begins Vinay Machiya Virai Puravi Yodu, Malay Uruvin Tol Parappi. Munai Muranga Talai Sendravar Virai Vayal Kavar Poti Manai Maram Virahaha. With the horses that are good in battle, you are spreading your armors which look like the dark rain clouds. You have a strong army which destroys enemies' lands. You have captured the enemy's paddy fields. You have destroyed their water sources by sending your male elephants. You have destroyed their houses and burnt them using the wood from their own roof as firewood. Mane Maram Virahaha. The burning village resembles the red sun. Pulangeda Virukkum Varambirane Tunevenda Seruvendri Pulavuvat Pular Sandin Murhar Sitrathu Uruyadu Kurisil. You need no help to conquer your enemies. Your sword stinks of flesh. You have sweet smelling sandal on your chest. You are like God Murha in your anger and in appearance. Here again, comparing the king to a deity. In the Puram poem 377, the Sangam poet Ulochanar talks of the benevolence of Pernar Kirli. And though a couple of verses do indicate certain Vedic rituals, there is nothing to indicate his performing a great royal sacrifice. The verses begin, Pani Parani Palyamattu my dishevelled hair was soaking wet from the heavy dew that fell all night. To remove my poverty, I went to his palace where he was sleeping sweetly, wet my kinnai drum and said, May you be protected by the celestials who eat ritual food. May you live for long. Avi unavinor purangapa. This refers to heavenly celestial beings for whom food is offered in a sacrificial fire, he welcomed me because he is charitable without end and doesn't hide what he owns. He cannot be compared to others whom poets have praised. Kanavil Kandang Varunda the Nirpa Nanavin Nalhi on Nasesal Tondrel Nadi and a Molivore Avan Nadi and a Molivore Vendu and a Molivore Avan Vendu and a Molivore. He saw me standing there and said, O Kinai drummer who has traversed many countries, you are in my care now. And he gave me sapphire from the mountains, gold from the forests, sparkling pearls from the sea, and various clothes and pots filled with liquor. He gave me all this, and as I stood there without sorrow, it seemed like a dream had come true. Those choosing the best country choose his. Those who would name a king, name him. May he live for long, the king who desires battles. So with nothing to indicate, Pernar Kirli having performed the Rajasuya Yaga in the Sangam corpus, from when and where does the epithet get its legitimacy? Looking into the epigraphical records of the medieval Cholas, especially the copper plates that record the great deed of their ancestors. Interestingly, the copper plates issued by the medieval Cholas were bilingual, 
in Sanskrit and Tamil, a trend that started after the 6th century common era with the advent of the Pallavas. Now, the Tamil part contained administrative details such as taxation, land records, grants of cultivable lands made to individuals or organizations and such things. While the Sanskrit portion dealt with prasasthis and gave legendary genealogies of the rulers, a mix of Puranic and historic personages thrown together with no respect to chronology. Three of the important copper plates issued by the medieval Cholas are the unbuilt plates, the laden plates and the Tiruvalangadu plates. T. A. Gopinatha Rao, the renowned epigraphist and archaeologist who documented the unbuilt plates issued by Sundara Sodan, the father of the great Rajaraja Sodan, shows how they were unique in that they record the first largest Brahmadeyam or land grant made at that time, 2080 Brahmins, while the laden plates issued by Rajendra Chola in 1014 Common Era recorded Rajaraja Sora donating an entire village for the purposes of a Buddhist shrine that was put up by a Malay king near Nagapattinam. The Tiruvalangadu copper plates were also issued by Rajendra Chola and in the Epigraphica Indica, T. A. Gopinatha Rao draws a comparative chart that shows the lineages given by all the three plates in the Sanskrit part. While in the laden plate, the Chola lineage starts from Vaivasvata Manu of Manushastra fame. The unbuilt plate starts from Lord Vishnu. Interestingly, in the Tiruvalangadu plates, the early Chola lineage starts from Pernarkilli. Commissioned by Rajendra Chola, it shows Pernarkilli as their earliest ancestor, followed by Karigala Chola and then Koperan Cholan, again throwing chronology to the wind. It is ironical how these great Cholas who built the great Peruvudayar Kovil that is known today as the Brahadishwarar Temple and the great temple at Gangai Kondasoraburam, leaving an indelible mark of their greatness for posterity, did not deem it necessary to record their own ancestry with precision. They seem to have been more concerned with reinventing themselves as a Kshatriya race with heavenly lineages and left it to the Brahmin scholars to record their history on these precious copper plates. The plates themselves carry the names of the Brahmin pundits who were commissioned to write them. Kotayar Nanda Narayanan of Vasishta Gotra authored the laden plates, Narayana Butter, son of Shankara Butter, the Tiruvalangadu plates, and one Madhava butter of Parachara Gotra, the unbuilt plates. If only our Sangam poems had done the same, we would be left with far less ambiguity. A redactor could have fixed the epithet Rajasuyam Veta to Perinarkili's name, and these medieval Cholas would have probably rejoiced at the stroke of genius. That Aryan ideals, rituals, and gods were being assimilated into Tamil culture towards the end of the Sangam age is quite clear by all these odd references found in the Sangam works. In fact, in his book, The History of the Tamils from the Earliest Times to 600 AD, P. T. Srinivasa Iyengar dedicates an entire chapter titled Aryan Ideas in Aham and Puram. The ambiguity surrounding these early rulers could indeed be frustrating to historians. And while P. T. S. ends the early Chola line with Pernar Killi, K. N. Sivaraja Pillai and Nilaganda Sastri register the successor of Pernar Killi as the last ruler of the early Cholas, Kochenganan. We will continue the history of the early Cholas with him in our next episode. Vanakkam.